Hi, my name is Adam Greenwood, and I am the CEO and founder of Greenwood Campbell. So we call ourselves the Human Tech Agency because the the work that we do uh, is 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 done to help improve people's lives, and something we're really proud of. Um, and this is the webinar to talk through uh, the what we learn, our team learn at Web Summit uh, in early November, twenty two. So um, yeah, team of seven of us went, stayed there for a week. Uh, Collectively, we took 660 something thousand steps, 104 metro rides, ate about 50 pasties to natta. We saw 103 talks between us and drank plenty of Superbox and, um, and Portuguese wine. So we, um, we made sure to listen out and do a bit of buzzword bingo, but also just to put together a, um, uh, a word cloud on some of, the, some of the subjects that were being mentioned. And one of the, the main things was was Twitter because at that time that was just when the, the final announcement of Elon Musk taking over Twitter had happened. But there was also a lot of talk about um, uh, marketing, uh, sustainability, metaverse, Web3. Uh, one of my favorite terms here was uh, TikTokification. But we're going to talk about some of these, or I'm going to talk about some of these over the next 10 to 15 minutes. So this is from a talk with Simon Soro, who's the founder of uh, WPP. Uh, for those who don't know, it's like the largest agency group in the world. Um, and he was talking about the digital ads market and what it's worth um, globally. Um, we're talking almost $500 billion per year is what is spent on uh, the top the top platforms. And to put that into a bit more context, here you can see the key players. So Google is still absolutely owning the space with uh, you know, almost a quarter of a trillion dollars spent every year. Uh, on, on their ads, uh, Meta, pretty big as well with Facebook and Insta, but also TikTok really starting to become a big player in the space as well, considering they've only been around for a couple of years. And I mean, with digital, you can uh, you can measure, you can experiment. So it really gives you an opportunity um, as a brand organization to be more efficient with your digital spending. But as you, and, and as you can see here, the average marketing budget on digital is going up. But consumers are also worried and, and you know, need a bit of reassurance and companies need to be conscious of the value in their experience um, uh, and their products and services. So we have to talk about Metaverse and this is the, the, the first slide on Metaverse. I'll talk about it a bit more later on as well. And, and as, as I said, it appeared a lot. We as a team tried to go to as many Metaverse talks as, as possible because brands are really going into it. Um, and I'll talk a bit more about what happened a year ago with Metaverse, but the things to be, the things that we heard people talking about outside of the opportunities, because there are some big opportunities in healthcare, training, working from home, gaming, music and sports. But brands are thinking now about privacy, security, uh, moderation, parental consent, that kind of thing. So, um, but also, there's still a lot of conversation about what it is and what the opportunity really is. So, um, so Adidas launched their metaverse, or was supposed to launch their metaverse last week, but actually, it turned out to be um, it turned out to be just a way of buying Adidas NFTs. So there was a load of talk about it, but then actually, they still haven't launched it. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens with metaverse. But as I said, I'll talk about that later on. The next thing I want to talk about was short film videos. So, I mean, they're literally everywhere. In 2020, uh, we saw this absolutely boom on TikTok. But since then, we've got Instagram and Facebook Reels. We've got YouTube Shorts. We've got Google Shorts. Uh, and they're showing up on Pinterest as well. They really are starting to appear everywhere. And there's some. we saw some really interesting stats about their um, their ability to, to convert um, and how much brands are spending on them. So this came from um, HubSpot's 2022 marketing industry trend survey um, saying that, yeah, I mean, that it's short form video has the highest ROI of any social media strategy. Um, you can see the QR code there. There's some more information from an organization called Animoto. They also noticed that 50% uh, of the value in a video is usually shared within the first three seconds. And I think, that that shows really clearly when you see movie trailers ads now on YouTube, because I don't know if you've noticed, I certainly have that you'll see a mini trailer, like a three second trailer before the trailer, just to try and grab the attention of people because uh, 
people's attention spans are definitely shorter. So uh, I saw this and I, I think I just put a quick slide in here. So there you have it, a three second trailer before the trailer even starts. So onto social commerce, something else that we saw a lot of talks on uh, at Web Summit. So it's been around for a while, but it's now becoming a real mainstream form of shopping. Now, social commerce is what it sounds like, which is being able to buy things on social platforms like Instagram and Facebook, but there are more elements to it. So, uh, I mean, really anything that has a social media kind of um, uh, like the ability to do any of the things you accept on social media. So, for example, Groupon has a social component. Uh, Revolut has a social component. eToro uh, has really brought in all this sort of social experience into trading stocks and shares. Um, and also, any, really, any, um, any platform like eBay or Depop, where buyers and sellers can talk directly, is considered to be social commerce. Uh, and just a lot of really fascinating stats at Web Summit about this subject. Um, so as you can see here, Instagram and TikTok are really our key players in this space. Instagram has Instagram Checkout, which makes the process of uh, advertising and selling through the platform really, really easy. And TikTok has this entire creator marketplace, which is like a dating app between brands and influencers. But you can see from some of these stats here that it's just getting big. I mean, for me, one in three users uh, of Facebook in 22 will make a purchase on Facebook. That's, that's pretty big. And then overall, the global social market value uh, was worth almost a trillion, almost half a trillion dollars in 2021. So back to the metaverse. So I wanted to just talk about the metaverse one year on. So I was in Web Summit in 2021 when Zuckerberg announced the rebrand of Facebook to Meta. And so that was a huge, huge um, conversation piece throughout uh, Web Summit 21. Um, but the metaverse and, and the, the metaverse is nothing new, but Zuckerberg's announcement really kind of threw it into the zeitgeist. So um, the, the term is out there now. And I just wanted to look a little bit about where are we a year on from that announcement? Firstly, in 22, people spent almost half a billion dollars on metaverse real estate. Now, uh, you can think of that what you will, but that's an incredible amount of money um, that's been spent on fictional uh, virtual uh, real estate across lots of different platforms like Decentraland, um, for example. Um, but it shows it's a very real thing that brands are really starting to invest, uh, brands and people are investing really big into so um, some other stats that we heard from various talks around and also just this little bit of video in the bottom right corner. This is Decentraland. Um, and just if the, for those of you who haven't seen it, it's, it's an interesting thing to check out. Um, you sometimes, sometimes you can get in without connecting a, a crypto wallet, which makes it a little bit, a little bit of a lower barrier to entry. Other times you try and connect and it, it wants you to connect by a crypto. So just something to look out for. But what we've seen, uh, as I mentioned before, applications are metaverse, remote work through... Um, Meta Workplace Horizons. Don't know how many of you have tried that, but putting an Oculus headset on and having a business meeting, it's actually quite interesting. Uh, it's arguably better than Zoom, obviously not as good as in the um, in person, but it's, it's certainly interesting and worth looking at. Um, certainly healthcare, rehabilitation for uh, people with disabilities, uh, training, shopping, there's, there's a lot of applications. Um, and I think as well, a stat worth looking at is, is what Gartner is saying, that by 2026, 25% of people spend an hour per day in the metaverse. Now that is a real kind of uh, soundbite of a quote from Gartner, but it is worth taking with a bit of a uh, pinch of salt because Gartner were the organization that in 2017 said that by 2020, 50% of all searches would be conducted by voice. And that's certainly, if you follow Greenwood Campbell, that's certainly something that we really latched onto um, when we were talking about voice, but it, it, it just didn't really solidify at all. Um, and even now, 2022, be interesting to, to hear from you how many searches you conduct via voice in a day. For me, who's a huge proponent of voice, it is not 50%. So just worth considering and taking with a pinch of salt. So this, yeah, so this is actually, I was talked about it before, this is Adidas's supposed metaverse launch. Now, I mean, it looks fantastic in terms of design of all these great clothes, but it, these are just NFTs and when I looked at one of them, I think they're going for about 80 US dollars for one of these items of clothing. 
And actually at this point, I couldn't work out any way of being able to attach this to an avatar in any metaverse um, of which there are already hundreds, if not thousands. So it's it's a real interesting kind of land grab for them, if that's the right word. Um, it, uh, and certainly looking at Adidas's career site, lots and lots of opportunities for people in metaverse. So next, GPT-3. So GPT-3 is not new, but again, there was a lot of discussion about it, about how some organizations were using it to write content at scale, um, and also about Google's own tools to try to work out ways of um, of detecting when something's written, written using it. For those of you who don't know what GPT-3 is, it is, um, it stands for generative, generative, generative pre-trained transformer. It's effectively an AI that can write content for you if you give it something to write about. So what I did in, in a way to try and explain this, uh, I said, write to GPT-3, write a speech that explains in simple terms what GPT-3 is and how it can benefit content writers and what came out, I'm now gonna to read to you, uh, my webinar audience. Uh, so, hello everyone. I'm here to talk to you about GPT-3. GPT-3 is a machine learning platform that can benefit content writers in two ways. GPT-3 can help content writers create better content because it can help content writers research topics faster and more efficiently. GPT-3 can also help content writers organize their thoughts better. GPT-3 can help content writers save time because it can automate some of the tasks that content writers have to do. For example, GPT-3 can help content writers format their articles better. Overall, GPT-3 is a machine learning platform that can benefit content writers in many ways. If you're a content writer, I urge you to check out GPT-3. So uh, the way I think of that is that, that feels like it has been written purely for a SEO benefit because it is kind of listed with uh, keywords, um, doesn't necessarily read that well, but I have seen articles and used it myself to write some really interesting content. So it's, it's something that anyone who is writing content for their own um, brand website uh, should be looking into. There's a QR code there in the corner, uh, which takes you straight to the OpenAI platform where you can see GPT-3. So next is DALI. So uh, again, saw some really interesting talks about this and it was only kind of launched to the public relatively recently. This uses the same AI, but instead of generating text, it can generate images. And it, it's, it's really interesting and good fun to play with. QR code again for you there to actually go straight to the platform. But it's a machine learning model uh, developed by OpenAI. And you can just see here, um, some of the things I typed in, like I still have Homer Simpson in the Blair Witch Project. Uh, Captain Cannabis was a pretty good one. And then, but I wanted to push it a bit further and just see if you could actually generate something that, that uh, a marketer might want to use. So I talked about a specific car uh, on a specific road with a background and even the type of photography. And as you can see, bottom right, that's really a pretty impressive piece of completely auto-generated imagery. So definitely something worth looking at. Uh, oh, and also uh, I, the last one I did was uh, uh, a typical marketing agency man presenting a talk about AI. And for those of you who were there um, at our, our live event last week, I mean, that's not, that's not part of what I look like. So next, personalization. So not a new thing, but still something that people are coming to expect. And as you can see the stats on the left, something that uh, people are really starting to vote with their feet. If they don't get personalization, they're not interest, interested. And I think a really good example of this is uh, Netflix. If you go to someone else's house, and fire up their Netflix, it's such a shock because it looks like a completely different platform. And then you realize just how personalized the content from Netflix is. Uh, and we're seeing it become a huge part of our daily lives. As I said, Netflix, YouTube, Spotify, so many different apps doing it, so many different e-commerce websites doing it as well. So really something that you should be considering. So Finally, I want to talk a little, about tech, little bit about tech to get excited about in 2023, just based on the talks and some of the demos that we saw at Web Summit. So first one was deep fake detection. Now everyone has seen and uh, some of the funny deep fakes out there, but there have been some attempted serious ones as well, um, where we've seen politicians um, uh, talking, saying things they're not supposed to say. And actually um, what's been really interesting, deep fake in text, uh, a much more manual version of this was what we saw last week with, with Twitter, where Elon Musk allowed anybody with $8 to be able to get a blue tick. And then we saw people tweeting as all kinds of organizations, some really um, contentious tweets 
which were causing real life damage. Um, and there were multiple Elon Musk accounts, for example. But uh, what we're starting to see now are tools that are specifically looking for video and audio files that have been somewhere manipulated by AI. So I think that's really good because the better the deep fake gets, the more difficult it's going to be and the more damaging it's going to be to society as a whole as we start to move into this sort of post-truth era. Ambulance drones. So, I mean, it, it literally is exactly what it says. It's um, it are drones that are piloted uh, and that can land on, uh, near somebody who needs help. They have uh, defibrillators and other life-saving equipment, which can be then um, the instructed, and then the user can be instructed on how to use it to save lives. Absolutely amazing. Yes. This song is In the Moon by Glenn Miller. Yes. What we wanted to do was design a robot that's easy. So uh, telehealth, uh, something we saw a lot. There was a there was a whole um, track dedicated to, to healthcare generally at Web Summit, but we saw that the, the telehealth market is absolutely huge, and we live in a um, we live in a in an aging society, and uh, we're getting at this double headed crisis where people are getting older and living longer. Um, and, and they need people to care for them and we don't have the carers to care for them. So we, I saw lots and lots of talks by uh, healthcare providers or telemetrics providers or people who are providing um, uh, healthcare workers in, in people's homes. Really huge, um, of huge opportunity uh, and something that we really want to get involved in um, as the human tech agency. Even that video there of um, uh, you know, robotic or robots looking after older people. It still kind of feels a bit silly, but even back in 2019, we did our own um, study using AI and voice technology to see if we could alleviate loneliness in older people's lives. And it, and it was actually really fascinating and really, um, it was uh, it made us feel great that we were actually able to make a small difference to people using technology. So definitely um, something really interesting and, and worth looking into. So gesture tracking, so uh, yeah, so we've got Tom Cruise um, on the left there for Minority Report or Tony Stark in uh, Iron Man, but um, really seeing a lot of gesture tracking uh, applications. Um, so certainly medical uh, testing, instrumentation, training, gaming, vehicle control. Um, the latest Oculus, Oculuses can detect your fingers. You don't have to wear gloves and you can see gestures. So it'd be really interesting to see what this technology can actually enable. And then finally, mixed reality um, wearables. So years ago, we saw Google um, putting a patent out for uh, um, augmented reality contact lenses. It's definitely something we're going to see soon. And Apple was supposed to announce this year um, their own AR headset, which they didn't, but I, I'm, most rumors think it's going to happen next year. Certainly, they are working right now on their ROS, which stands for Reality Operating System, which I think is, you know, in equal measures, exciting and terrifying. So that's uh, that's it. That's that's just a, a kind of snippet of what we learned at Web Summit. There is a huge guide um, with uh, about. 15 articles uh, that go much, much deeper into what we learn. Uh, you can get it on this QR code and I will also put a link to it uh, in this post. Thanks everybody for listening. Uh